Welcome to the Cross Border Interview, where we sit down with local elected leaders across Canada. Throughout this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. In today's episode, we are honored to chat with City of Barrie, Ontario, Councillor Sergio Morales. But before we dive into our interview, 2024 is right around the corner. And for the month of December, we are running an exclusive 2024 New Year special. For just $20.24 every three months during 2024, immerse yourself in a year of exclusive perks and behind-the-scenes access to great content we have in store for you for 2024. So be ready to be part of the national conversation around municipalities and experience the magic of cross-border interviews. Simply click the support the show link on the cross-border interviews website to subscribe to your quarterly holiday special and make your first donation today. Now on to our interview with Councillor Morales. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. We greatly appreciate it for sitting down, taking time out of your busy schedule to talk about yourself and the city of Barrie. But before we talk about the city, I want to talk about you. And I start all my interviews off with the same question, so you're no exception to that. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Sergio? Some people dreamed about playing in the NHL. Some people dreamed of, you know, uh, I don't know, going Formula One, NASCAR. I dreamt of public service. And I can come up with a story that, like, I was inspired by individual. It was just something that I was always drawn to when I was younger, specifically in elementary school. And it was something that I kind of just expected of myself. The nice thing about having, a, a, a de- having an interest in public service, as you get older, you start to realize um, that different people are meant to serve in different ways. That might be a volunteer for some people that might be on a board, on a Rotary, on a Kiwanis, on a Knights of Columbus. For other people, that's a a, a public service. So um, it's just kind of always been with me. And I'm fortunate that uh, my voters in 2014 at the age of 21 um, gave me that opportunity and I haven't looked back. Was mom and dad political or did you come from a little (laughs) That's the thing. So your question is great. Like, I have to remind my parents to vote. Sometimes I give them advice. I never tell someone how to vote, but like, hey, like this. Like, no, my parents are the perfect uh, um, sample size of, you know, if they say, oh, I don't think that person's electable anymore. And it's funny, I look at the election, I'm like, yep, that person lost federally or provincially, or, or they go, I like what that person's saying. I'm like, they're kind of the coal, uh, canary in the coal mine. Um, so, you know, sometimes when you get the kind of eagerness of a young politician, it comes from a family of politicians, one way or another, but uh, that, that wasn't the case with me. So you you have an an interesting career that you've sort of laid out in almost uh, three terms now, three elections, three uh, wins for you. 2014 elected as as 21. And this is quite unusual, especially for larger communities, Mm -hmm. particularly in the city of Barrie. What was it before we get about how you got elected? What was it about the draw municipally? Because we are a municipal show talking to municipal leaders. So what was it about municipally for you that you said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start municipally. Yeah. So Barry in 2014, um, after the annexation of land from Innisfil in 2010, Barry was, was set itself on a trajectory of growth and yeah, and change. So especially as you eased into 2014, you've got the official plan, you've got lands ready to go, real estate prices are getting to a point where there's, it's a lot more than just your local developers just trying to attract money. Um, Barry was poised to see uh, transformative growth over the next 20 years, meaning, and the area that I ran in specifically, the ward I I represent now that I didn't live in at the time, um, was poised to be unrecognizable um, based on that development. So uh, the, I also looked at the council uh, just before that, and it had young councillors. Uh, our current mayor, uh, who just turned like 38, I think at the time he was finishing his council term, he was going to run to be an MP in 2015, so he didn't run again. And so at the time, he must have been 29. So he started at 21 as well, was leaving at 29. Um, and then before him was Patrick Brown, who was elected at 22. Um, and and then we also had another councillor who was elected in the downtown ward. We're not talking a new suburban ward, the downtown, which is usually very competitive. You get a lot of like, so-and-so has been around the community for 30 years. And uh, Lynn Strawn was elected, I believe at 25. And before the incumbent that I defeated, before him, the incumbent at the time in 2006 was elected at 25 years old. So there was always a young presence on Barry City Council since 
the year 2000, I believe. And for the first time, um, there was going to be a council where there was no youth presence at all. And I'm not just talking 20s or even 30s. There was going to be no 20s and 30s um, at all. So I saw an opportunity uh, of the need to have a young counselor who can help be part of shaping that 20 years of growth and can really uh, help develop a better city and a better vision. Shaping the growth uh, from a youth perspective is is an is, is an uphill battle, and I'll, I'll say that just being blunt here, because I, as someone who ran when they were twenty as well in the in Clarington, Ontario, in two thousand ten, the one thing I heard over and over again when I was door knocking was, "You're young, you give it ten years and then come back." Did you hear that at the doorsteps, or were people because you had that sort of past experience in the city of Barrie, where people? relatively young get elected that they were like okay mm-hmm. another youth we're happy and we're willing to uh potentially even think about p- casting their vote because hypothetically they don't have to cast their vote if they talk to you absolutely absolutely so yes so to answer your question yes i was very fortunate by the pioneers that came before me who made it who made the reality of i just opened my door and some 20 young 20 year old wants to run for council represent me um to them, that was normal. Whether it was their own previous counselor, again, the, the the one in 2006 at 25 in my district or other wards, or especially Patrick Brown and the current mayor, Alex Nettle, they definitely made a, a, a big impact on that. They broke that ceiling, per se. So it was a lot easier for me. So now the it was within the realm of possibility for them to think of having a 21 counselor. So that made it easier. However, I very much had to earn it in the sense of I was lucky. I never heard the you're too young. Uh, I heard a lot of, are you sure you want to do this? Kind of that, it was a cautionary older parent almost like, you sure you want to do this kid? Because, uh, you know, it's not everything, you know, because I had this, like, and I still have it. I have this hope in my eyes, very talkative. I talk a million miles an hour. And so they're like, I remember one person saying like, it might grind you down. It might take away that, that, that spirit that you have. And I'm like, oh, I know what I'm getting myself into. And I would make a joke. And I'm like, listen, if I lose the spirit, you can vote me out next time. So uh, it went well. So I got a lot of cautionary materials. The one thing that I would get a lot of comments, Chris, and this is really funny, I would get a lot, probably like multiple dozens of people would say, I love your ideas. I love about investing in infrastructure at the same time as growth. I love about not just growing up or growing up. I love about the kind of some of your common sense solutions. Sir, I love the ideas. When do I get to meet Sergio? And I'm like, I I am Sergio. So picture me now, I'm 30. They thought you were a scrutineer. (laughs) So I'm 30 right now and I look like probably not that young anymore, but I still look younger than 30 when i was 21 i looked 16 years old i'm not i'm not exaggerating um so when you when, when you're a, a, an adult when you're at the, your doors and this person who looks 16 years old is very passionate it's going off a lot of people thought it was yeah uh, volunteering for sergio the candidate so it was so awkward every time i had to say i am sergio and some would turn red some would say oh my gosh now you definitely have my vote i'm embarrassed and some would be like i'm so sorry i thought you were his high school volunteer so that was the only issue that I had with my age was the visibility of my youth specifically in my face. In terms of my ideas, um, or or people were very accepting of the idea, the energy. Um, I never, I was, I was waiting for the classic like, okay, you want to run for council? You don't have the life experience. You don't pay property taxes at the time. Uh, how can you make decisions for for me about my property taxes and these decisions when you yourself don't have these challenges or the experience? I didn't get that question a lot. And I think it's because uh, people in Barrie, at least in that area of town, aren't asking you, you know, where's your 30 year service and who was your grandpa uh, and what family last name do you have? They're more like, what do you have to offer now? What do you have to offer me uh, for the vision? What did you have to offer? So you talk about the youth perspective, and and I think it's an important aspect that a lot of people forget that we do need more young people to get involved. But looking back on that 2014 election, what was that one thing that you offered to residents where they were able to say, okay, we may not fully agree with 100% of things that Sergio says, but he he has given us an indication of where he wants to see Ward 9 and the city of Barrie move forward 10, 20 years from now. Perfect. So when I say the youth perspective, I mean, it. it I didn't run on being the young candidate. I actually, I remember a reporter telling me, hey, you're young. There's a 19 year old running for mayor and there's a 23 year running against someone who's now the MP. I had no chance. Um, I want to do a story about young people running. And I told the reporter, no, I said, I won't be part of the story. If you frame me in, if you frame me as I'm running to get people engaged in democracy and we need more young people, because if you frame me that I said, I will lose. 
I'm happy to do the feature if you do us like together, but somewhat separate. If they want, like I knew the person running for mayor, his goal was noble and he, he was to bring attention to youth and politics. He wanted to make a statement. The other, the other gentleman, he did want to win, uh, but he leaned in on his university involvement with student politics and et cetera. That was not my, my flavor. I said, I'm running to win. And I said to a reporter, I said, I'm going to win. So let me know there. So I didn't run as the young person to make a statement. I ran to bring a youth perspective to, to decision making. And that means long term thinking. So, Chris, my, my slogan time was restoring vision for Ward 9. Ward 9 is going to see 20 years of unrecognizable growth. And we're going to increase by you know 80,000 people. Will you be proud of the Ward 9 and the city that you recognize in 20 years? And as someone who's young, my message to the doors was, if I earn your vote, I'll be around in 20 years to see the end of this vision. It won't be the classic government of one administration comes in and goes this way, then they come in and undo it. I can see it through the finish line. And then the example I would give, I would say, okay, you live in a cookie cutter home, similar to the 905 in the, G in the GTA in Ward 9. So you have 12,000 people in this neighborhood and the main access road, the main Davis Drive or the main Dixie or whatever you want to call it, is a two lane rural road. That is lack of vision. This road should have been widened with both the infrastructure and the road lanes at the same time, these subdivisions, because these subdivisions went in in 1999, 2001, and yet it's 2014 and they're saying, yeah, it's coming, it's coming. I can understand a year or two, but not a 13 year delay. And I'm going to bring a long term vision to not only get me moving widened, but to make sure we don't repeat these mistakes. And Chris, no matter if you were left, right, or somewhere in between, that message about long-term thinking and kind of a, a different perspective resonated with ever, most people. So you're you're almost coming up to 10 years in public office now. Uh, 2014, you're elected. It's 23, 23 when we're recording this. You talk about that 20-year vision that you had in 2014. We're coming up halfway of that, that, that sort of vision that you uh, envisioned in 2014. Do you think you've gotten sort of the gears moving to ensure that that vision that you set out in 2014 is going to be a reality in 2024 or 2034, I should say? And are you halfway there? Are you majority of the way there? What does that vision look like in 2014, uh, 2024 compared to 2014? Um, great question. Uh, a lot of the fundamentals are done. So quick recap, the road I was talking about, the main artery, it's done. That's I went Maple, from that two, right? Maple View Drive East, yes. It went from the two-lane rural road with the side ditches. It is five lanes with a turning lane, with the proper sidewalk and the multi-use, multi-modal path on one side. That is, cyclists love it, uh, pedestrians love it, and the city loves it because instead of plowing two, we have one more efficient infrastructure. So that is done. Uh, proper lighting and all the way from Heronia to Young Street. Like, yes, that Young Street, the one that goes all the way to Toronto, piece at the GO station. So that was done. Um, other side roads that needed to be uh, repaired or widened were also done, but that was the main one. So my most of the infrastructure that I ran on directly uh, has been completed uh, and some of it actually ahead of schedule. And I actually found res during the, the campaign, a lot of residents were like, Sergio, like, you know, we're not only getting the roads fixed, but some of these are getting done ahead of schedule. And there was one time where we actually had to shut down, you'll appreciate the story. We had to shut down Maple View specifically between Heronia and Country Lane, which is basically like the beginning into Ward 9 and the rest of Ward 10, Southeast Barrie. And people would have to go around now. And it would actually, I'm not being dramatic, but actually had like 15 minutes everybody's drives because it was the main point. And I, we had two options. And staff came to me and said, if we don't shut it down, I forget the numbers, but it'll be a significant additional cost. And the high hundreds of thousands, possibly just under a million dollars. If we don't shut it down, we'll do that. So more money and it'll extend the project by a year. But if we shut it down for December, the worst time you can shut down a road. If we shut it down in December for about three, four weeks, we will save all those hundreds of thousands of dollars and we won't fall behind a year. And they said, you probably want to not shut it down, right? And I said, I was elected to do the right thing, not what's popular. I was elected to do what is the right thing to do. So instead of just saying, go with the shutdown and uh, you know I'm gonna put my, my email on vacation mode. Um, what I did was I contacted local radio station. I have a good relationship uh, with the morning show there. And I said, I wanna get ahead of this. I wanna put my face to the issue. I wanna own the issue. So Tara had me on the show and I said, listen, most politicians run away when there's inconveniences or something like this. I wanna own it. I want to tell residents that these are our options and I want to tell them that I've made the decision to go this way. It's not popular, 
but I want to go here on radio and, and take it on the chin and at least let you guys know what's going on. I did a really good job of getting it on social media. And I had lots of people, not only residents, but stakeholders and community saying that was a very unorthodox way of making a tough, but the right decision. And then the way of communicating it um, was also very effective. You mentioned something that I pick up a lot on when I speak to municipal leaders from across Canada, doing the right thing and doing the tough thing and doing the right thing and doing the popular thing is often uh, at loggerheads when you have to make a decision, because you have to look at every individual issue as uh, what is going to be best for the general public, not just for the here and now, but for the general public. How do you do that? How do you do that in a community like Barrie, in a city like Barrie, where you yourself uh, do not go to uh, Toronto to do your job as an MPP. You don't go to Ottawa to do your job as an MP. You make a decision and you're going to be stopped at the local grocery store the next day, the week after, and you're going to have to sort of dissect that. How do you make the right decision when sometimes it means going against the popular opinion on social media? <laughs> the way you do that, Chris, is something you said earlier. You gain people's trust, and I don't. I don't, I don't want to give you the the the, the hallmark uh, cook, uh, uh, generic answer. Here's what I mean by that: If you earn people's trust right away, meaning 2014, you hit the ground running, you earn it with that radio feature that I did. If you earn people's trust at the beginning, uh, tr you can lose trust after 10 years. But if you know if you don't gain trust at the beginning, it's hard to get it after. So if you gain people's trust, what people will say when they see an unpopular decision is they'll say, listen, I really don't agree with Sergio on this idea. I think he's wrong. I just think he's wrong. I think we should, I think we should ban bonfires in backyards, which I'm against. Um, I think uh, I should be able to keep parking my car on a five lane busy road. No, we needed to go to no parking if you got your road wide. And I'm sorry, it doesn't matter that you bought 20 years ago and life changed. That's, that's the social contract of living in a city. Um, but when I'm clear, when I give them an honest moment of my time, and I'm not sarcastic or dismissive, but I give them a clear explanation, they can hang up the phone or finish reading the email and go, I don't agree with his decision on this one issue, but he has earned my trust in general. And so I know that on, on average, on 100 decisions, I that, and they're too busy to watch council and pay attention to 100, they might read here and there in the paper, they trust me enough to give me their vote and to earn the, the right to represent them as a counselor in general. And I've got people who, after a 40 minute discussion or 15 minute discussion, they said, I don't agree with you on this, but I still respect you and you still will always have my vote because you maintain my trust. So to answer your question, trust is the most effective way in order for a politician to have the political um, uh, runway and the political um, uh, uh, ability to make those unpopular decisions. You use the word respect in that last statement. And I want to pick up on that because I think that's another key aspect that municipal councillors have to deal with because you have to go out and talk to everyone, not just the people who agree with you, not your echo chamber on social media, but everyone, even the ones who vehemently disagree with you, but you have to do it in a respectful way and they yeah. have to do it in a respectful way because I can imagine you have heard the curse words, the, the name calling that probably comes with the job. But you have to respect people to give you your time because you're their elected official. How much does respect come into play when dealing with the public to make sure that if you're at the grocery store and they stop you, well, guess what? That milk run is not going to be 10 minutes. It's going to be a half hour. You know what? It's um, I have rarely heard the curse words or like the overly aggressive personal from Ward 9 residents. You know, I hear it a lot on the online trolls who don't live in the world. Exactly. So the, the non-real world, you hear it all the time. And specifically, like, what's hilarious is the far left people in Barry think I'm this, like, big evil conservative that was, like, mentored by Patrick Brown. And some of the more right-wing people in town think I'm this, like, liberal that, like, isn't very, like, adherently conservative. So um, the joke is that if, they, if the far corners of, of, of the political spectrum think I'm either evil or not making the right decision, I'm probably in the right area for municipal politics. I'm thinking common sense and I'm not giving blind ideology to any one issue. Um, so anyways, as a result, online is different. Everything you said exists. And listen, if they don't have respect, I, I don't respect them. It's, a, it's that simple. They don't earn that respect. Um, uh, they, they're, they're still entitled to a response and uh, a clear no but they're going to get their solid answer because it's the wrong thing or the right thing to do with residents. I haven't found that they like, there's been a couple at the doors or randomly, but a lot of people maybe unfortunate are still maybe non-confrontational with their municipal counselor. Like if they get to, if I get to their door and I'm in their space, maybe their kids in the hallway, 
uh, or the impression. So I don't get a lot of that. Like door slams, like this past campaign, maybe two, like two. And I not and I unlocked all the doors myself and did wow. a second round of volunteers. So those are really good numbers. Uh, there were some the people like I can see in their face that they were not impressed. Like, oh, it's you. But they were polite enough. So that social contract, I think, still exists. And going back to your point about respect, when you give people, a, a, when I get to a door and I see that they're kind of disagreeing with me, either on an issue or just in me in general, I say, listen, I came to your door unsolicited, so I appreciate it. I know it's not the answer you wanted to hear, but if you give me an honest moment of your time, I'll give you an honest moment of mine. The role of municipal governments has changed a lot over the last 10 years. When I first put my name forward in 2010, the role of municipal government was very cut and dry. But I, I truly don't believe that the average resident understands the jurisdictional roles, like probably you and I do, that the municipality plays compared to the other levels of government. How often do you hear from residents on issues that do not pertain or are not even in the jurisdictional purview of the municipality? Are people talking to you about provincial issues, federal issues? And when you do hear those issues... What is your uh, response? Because you can't just brush people off because you have to respectfully give them your time to answer the questions that they have. I, I think I have two answers to that. When I started the job, I wanted to fix everybody's issues. <laughs> I wanted to clean up their garage and change their oil. And you quickly realize if you want to, if you want to not burn out emotionally, it's not just time-wise, if you don't want to burn out and, and become disenfranch disenchanted by the job that you wanted to bring a vision and you had this energy of people going, yeah, we'll vote for someone who looks 16 because he's inspired me. Um, if you don't want to lose that, you have to kind of like set expectations for yourself. So at the beginning, to answer your question, what I would do is even if it was a provincial federal issue, I would um, like call directly the MP or MPP and I wouldn't take their, I wouldn't take the constit staffer. I would vote to them. I'd book a meeting. I'd to call and make sure I got the phone call. Uh, I, I'd even research it myself and I realized I, in order to be the most effective municipal counselor I can be, I need to know my limitations. And it's not like, oh, that's not my department or not my jurisdiction. Uh, it's not about being dismissive, but it's about being able to preser preserve and set boundaries for myself to be more effective. So what I've done now and, and kind of maybe made that change, I would say around 2017, is I will respond, call or phone and let them know, listen, that's not the jurisdiction, but then I would have, instead of just saying, call this person, here's a number, have a nice day. I would say, here's my advice of what you can do on this. You could approach this person. You could approach, I don't know, the property manager and then go to the, to the uh, political side and make an appointment with a constit uh, manager. And if you need a, a letter of reference, or if you want a soft introduction, so you get a little bit warmer response, I'm happy to do that. So even as recently as a month ago, I got a, a citizenship question. Well, we don't do citizenship. And he was, when I said, go to the MP's office, his instinct, and it wasn't about the local MP, his, 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 his understanding of government in general was just like, oh, I'll, I'll just get bogged in the system. I said, how's this? Call them and tell, and I said the person's name, tell them Sergio referred you. And if you really want, email them and CC me an email. You'd be surprised how quickly I'm going to do absolutely nothing. But if that goes, and then people feel like you're not just brushing them off, they feel like you're empowering them to get an answer. Um, I have one last question on this area, and then I want to turn to the city as a whole. And I want to talk about apathy, because I I believe, and this is me saying this, not the counselor, this is Chris saying this, uh, the host of the show. I think there's a true apathy when in this country when it comes to municipal politics. I, I, I don't see the active participation that we see provincially or even federally, because traditionally they're partisan. Now, I've done a little bit of research on you, and you pride yourself on being an independent thinker and an independent sort of voice on council. How do you ensure that the apathy that we are seeing across Canada, and maybe not in Barrie as much as other places, but how do you ensure that everyone feels like they have a voice and everyone is being heard when sometimes people just don't want to talk to their councillor or mayor because as long as my water is turned on and my garbage is picked up, I'm happier than a pig on a feed day. What do you do in that situation when people just don't want to give you their opinion and they're just are comfortable with the way things are? So there's two ways to, to reduce that apathy because there's two different people who are apathetic. One is, what's the point on, 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 on giving feedback or giving opposition to City Hall? You can't beat City Hall. So there's that one. Um, there, actually, there's three. There's also the people that go, I don't really know what City Hall does. Like my water and my garbage gets picked up. So like, I don't really know what you guys do. Um, 
you know, watch The Simpsons. I see Mayor Quimby. Maybe that's what you guys do. That's it. So that's the, the person. And then the third one is um, I'm so happy. And my, my th things that are priority to me are getting done. And they're maybe a little more educated to go. I know that you guys, you know, I think I don't know who said it. Uh, the feds have all the money. The province has all the power and we have all the problems. So I know you guys ha don't have a lot of ways to make change. I'm just happy you take care of the municipal services. And I otherwise, I'm disengaged because things are getting done. So the way to approach those different people is the person who thinks it can't beat City Hall is you show them that you care. And there was a lot of people at the door, like when I got in 2014, like very small things, like the light bulb on the street light is out or this little thing or, or, or somebody did an illegal dump on the curbside beside the mailbox. Like at 21, I would say, I'm you know, like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm taking a picture of the incident. I'm not your counselor yet, but I'm going to fix this for you before the election. As a member of the public, anybody can contact customer service at your local municipality and put in the legwork. You don't have to be a counselor. Um, and so I would do that. And like, I would come back the second time. People were like, it got done, sir, within a week or two. And they're like, you definitely have my vote. So show them you care and that you actually are going to solve the issues is, is for those people and give them an honest moment of your time. Like I said earlier, if, if, if you can fix your issue, great. And if you can't, or if you disagree, tell them, do, be firm. Don't pander. Don't say you'll look into it. Don't give them false hope. That's how you empower NIMBYs. And that's how you empower bad decisions. But say no, and then explain why. And then that's it. And the, the, the other person, the person who doesn't know what we do, um, I pride myself on, I think, the last nine years. For seven years uh, in a row, I was the highest spending counselor on Barry City Council. And I pride myself on that. Because I got to doors in 2014, and I said, do you know who your counselor is? And they said, no, most said no. And I'm like, exactly. When I come back, you'll know who I am. Whether you're like me or not, you're going to know who I am because we get a budget. And I told them, I'm like, it's not like our MPs or MPBs. They get like hundreds of thousand dollars. At that time, it was $2,200. And we weren't small. We weren't a rural municipality. I'm like, we got $2,200. You're going to get a, news, a newsletter, a Christmas card, and you're going to have a website. You're going to get the bare minimum. And that's just not happening. Not just in that my ward, but because of a lot of the older counselors, they just they didn't want to have a website. They didn't want to deal with that. So I said, you're going to get that level of service. And some of the internet kind of trolls, whenever the story came out, Sergio tops, tops uh, spending again, they were like, oh, look at this. And people jump in and be like, A, it's like $3,000, relax. And B, like, there's clearly, he got acclaimed in 2018. There's clearly a reason that they're happy with that level. And I would say to the media, I told my residents in 2014, I'm going to spend every single penny to communicate with you and do my job. So how you get that second person is by communicating with them at City Hall, newsletters. I've even had uh, digital billboard ads when we we're doing the construction shutdown um, or, or back to school, please slow down around the school because of the construction. So, and they, they were they were centered around a message. They weren't just like my face giant. They were specific with, with, with an actionable item. And now the last person, the person who is so happy that everything's going well uh, and you don't want, and, 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 and they're just happy with that. Um, you engage with them once in a while, they'll reach out to you. And if you do respond, even on a smallest issue, they go, listen, I don't have to talk to city hall a lot, but when I do, I reach out to you, you get back to me quick, whether it's a yes or a no. And that's how you keep those people engaged. I want to turn to my second segment now, and it's about the city as a whole. But before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is the councillor's opinion. Councillor, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Barrie as of recording this episode right now? Housing. It is House. housing. We need more housing. Uh, we're, we we. We, we have reached a situation, not just in Barrie, but in, in Southern Ontario and in, in other places in, around the country that, um, you know, go to school, get a good education, technical or academic, get a good job, work your nine to five, save some money. And you don't have to live a fancy life, but you'll be able to afford to buy a decent house. Doesn't have to be fancy. You'll be able to save money. That's gone. And here's the thing. We're not talking about the 80s or 70s. Like, Chris, we're talking about like when you ran in most of Southern Ontario, houses could still be bought between 240 to let's call it 550 on the upper end. And now that 220 house in Barrie is 850, 900. And I'm not even talking about the Southern GTA. Um, that's not acceptable and people are losing hope. And that's why you see what you see at the federal level and provincial level. That's why you see a bit of the changes in housing policy. So the biggest challenge we're facing is up until recently, up until about a year ago, Barrie was in the top 
five, specifically hovering around number two and number three of most place, expensive places to rent for a one or for a two bedroom, one of those categories uh, in national surveys consistently for seven years, because Barrie has been historically anti-density and this is not acceptable. And I think we're getting to a place between the work Dr. Mike Moffat has made, advocacy around the province and many, many other people that I won't be able to list everybody where the, pol the municipal politics of appe appeasing to NIMBY desires of just, nope, I don't want any housing. I don't care if it's a building, a townhouse, nothing. I don't want anything. I moved here in 1975. This is what I bought into. That's not how it works anymore. And uh, I'm really glad to see not just locally, but uh, provincially and hopefully nationally that the political uh, winds are changing and we're going to be getting more housing built. So housing comes with a cost, though, because you, I'm assuming after 10 years, you will probably know that to build housing, you need infrastructure and infrastructure is not cheap these days. And before any developer even looks at an area, they want to know that there's going to be the proper infrastructure that they will not have to fully uh, pay for. So how do you balance the the understanding that housing is needed, but you need to invest right now and Right now, there's an affordability crisis that is tackling a lot of the country, well, the majority of the country, if not all of the country right now. And that means you have to potentially look at reallocating service levels or reallocating money to ensure that infrastructure gets built so that way you can build housing. Perfect. I'm going to, you said your hometown is Clarington, right? Yeah. I'm going to use Clarington kind of an example because it'll make a lot of sense. So how there's a cost that comes with more housing. So you one, I can make the argument. I'm going to go on the other side for a second. Uh, um, you know what? We may need more housing, but we can't do it at the expense of existing taxpayers and people who contribute to this community. Um, it would be unfairly and unjustly adding a multi-hundred million dollar bills uh, in perpetuity that our grandchildren would be paying uh, for residents who haven't even been here. And so we need to be smart about it and go to go do studies at committees for 10 years. That is the name of the argument. The reality of somewhere like Clarington is Housing, growth doesn't usually pay for growth, only when we're talking about suburban uh, sprawl. When we're talking about track housing, this argument stands. So what I approach in Ward 9, or I'm going to stay on the example of Clarington, so yes, maybe the city uh, doing 1.5 kilometers of water pipes, natural gas, and infrastructure and roads is very unpalatable and, not, and, and should be voted down. But that's if we're approving cookie-cutter subdivision of singles and semis. If you mix in singles, and they're still a part of the equation, by the way, if you get rid of cul-de-sacs, they, they need to be gone. But if you keep some singles in there, row homes, um, um, as well as semis, back-to-backs, stacked count houses. And now all of a sudden, if Clarington gets, if it's just normal that on a somewhat arterial road, you just by default, as of right, approve six-story buildings because it's on the Ontario building code out of wood. Now that developer's performa goes, I'm not just fitting in 12 townhouses here on this land. I can throw up. Uh, uh, 70 units. And now the math works. Now we get more housing for Clarington. And now we get a more fiscally responsible um, infrastructure investment into growth. So growth doesn't pay for growth when it's the wrong time type of growth. And we need to push back on NIMBY forces in order to show how we need uh, better built forms, better densities and varieties in order to get to the end goal. You see that the people of Barrie are willing to have that discussion because you talk about the NIMBYism and the NIMBYism are the loud ones, right? The NIMBYism, uh, no matter where you go in this country, NIMBYism is always the loudest bunch of people in the, the community. Do you do you get a feeling that people of Barrie are looking for change, looking for this type of diversification of housing? Um, Chris, in my campaign literature in 2012, 2022, running against three, three opponents who all lived um, in the ward, grew up like the two young uh, candidates. One was 21 at the time, one was 33. So fun fact, Ward 9 loves young people. Uh, so they grew up in the neighborhood. So they were the 20 year experience. Uh, and the uh, the older gentleman, um, uh, or not 20s, uh, he uh, also had 20 years of living in the neighborhood. So, and I had, I think I don't live in the neighborhood anymore. I, I moved there after I lived there. Uh, I bought a condo, lived there for like a couple of years and then move back to kind of where I grew up. And residents know that. I don't hide from that. I'm saying this to you in the interview because again, my neighborhood isn't who's your grandpa, what's your family name? And yeah, it's kind of like, okay, what are you going to do? Or like the, your results? That's fine. I moved here 10 years ago. That doesn't matter to me. So to answer your question on that campaign, in my main literature, uh, in kind of like my platform, I put a picture of a seven-story building, the tallest building, which 
I'm not proud to say that the tallest building in my district of cookie cutter -ness, I put the picture of it and said, one of my items is to fight for more housing of all types and all sizes because you and your grandchildren deserve to have a place to grow up here or, or retire if you choose to. I did not hide from it. I didn't say only appropriate growth. I said all types of built. I said cut red tape, hire more planners, stand up to overzealous uh, NIMBY groups, essentially special interest groups and overzealous counselors because I said, if you, you, your grandchildren shouldn't have to move, and this is a line I'm borrowing from Dr. Mike Moffitt, they shouldn't have to move away to Northern Ontario because they can't afford, you know, let's say you're somebody in your 60s and you have grandkids because your kids can't afford to stay locally. You'll never see your grandchildren. So that argument resonates well. And I kind of borrowed that. And I said, your, grand, your children deserve to raise their families here the way you raise them if they choose to. And you as a retiring senior, you should have the right to be able to downsize in your community if you want to stay here. So it's all about option. And I put a picture of a seven story building um, that was supposed to initially be two story retail. And I would joke to some residents who really supported me at the doors or afterwards, I said, how many politicians do you know that would put the biggest dense, densest development that have ever been approved in the neighborhood on the re-election platform? And they're like, not a lot, you, you've got guts. And I said, because I believe in the message and um, my vote percentage from my first election went up in the most recent election. I ended up at 67.5%. Um, and there was no clear second person. It wasn't like, okay, it was you and far behind, it was one alternative. It was evenly spread among the other three. And I had, you know, this kind of like a sports stat, you can make a stat about anything, but out of the number of people who took the time to vote in my district and all the districts in, in Barrie, you know, I looked at the number, how many people took the time to vote and went, I'm voting against the incumbent, like in all the words. Uh, at, not as a percentage, because they're all different sizes of wards, but as a magnitude, I had the least number of people vote against me out of any district in the city. And I put, here's a giant building beside your cookie cutter subdivision. So I think the overturn window is changing, Chris. I think people are realizing um, that we need more housing and that outdated uh, philosophies of using city hall to stop needed housing is gone. And what I try to work with people on, I'm like, okay, listen, the density is going to happen but you have concerns about snow storage, let's work on that. You have concerns about the street light or the internal lights on the surface parking lot being too bright and shining up to your house, let's do bollard lights. Like I'll push the developer to do bollard lights, period. You have concern about outdoor amenity area? Absolutely, they should be providing more. You have concern about noise or, or, or the turning driveway? I will 100% work on those real issues uh, instead of giving false hope about the project overall. So I, I want to flip the the original question on its head for a second because I've been accused of only talking about issues that municipalities face. So I've got to ask the sort of the uh, 360 question, and that is, what does Barry get right? What does it do right that you boast about to other municipal leaders from across Ontario or even across Canada? We have a sense of place. We're not a suburb of the GTA. Nothing wrong with the GTA, by the way, but you definitely know when you're in Barrie and when you're not, unlike a, maybe a municipality in GTA, you don't know where that boundary is. So we have a sense of place. We have a sense of identity. Uh, we have a sense of culture, as corny as that is for municipal. Uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. That doesn't mean like we're not progressive. We're, we're very urban. Uh, uh, we've got a good art scene. We've got a, we're starting to get a good restaurant scene. Um, but because we know who we are, we don't forget where we kind of came from in the sense of, of a city of 170,000 now you run into the person in the grocery store and you get recognized by two, three people and you stop. And even if you're not a counselor, you have this conversation, you run into Billy at the bank and say, how's grandma? So that is something that you usually only find in places that are under 30,000. Like you might still find it in Aurelia. You're going to find it in, in like Leamington. You're probably, but you usually don't find it once you get above 130. Uh, but places like Barrie, I know Guelph has a bit of that quaintness in, in Kingston, but you don't find it in Pickering and they're smaller. You don't find it in Whitby. So we do that right. And, we invest in our people. Our waterfront is our jewel. Not only the natural, uh, the natural design of it, which we didn't do, but beyond that, the way we've developed the actual boardwalk and the park and the and and, and prioritizing people, places, and pushing the parking in the back, but still doing adequate. That is something we've done right. So I think we get our waterfront right. Um, we get our our identity right, and uh, and and really maintain that cohesiveness of of our social identity. In addition to I guess, do, what do we get right? We have ski hills 10 minutes away and we have the water five minutes away. But I don't know if we can take credit for that. I guess we just do all the other things well that it enhances what was naturally given to us. 
So I want to turn my last segment before I have to let you go here because I am cautious of time and I want to talk about my favorite subject and it's because I have promised that if you come on my show, I will appear in your community spending my economic dollars and that is tourism. I enjoy tourism. I enjoy Canadian tourism. So I've got to ask the million dollar question on the tourism file and that is what are the hidden gems of Barry that don't often get talked about but you want to promote right here right now with listeners from across Canada and around the world? So when you come to Barry, listeners around the province, around the world, uh, you are again ten. You are ten to forty minutes from ski hills. Ten, if you don't mind, if you're not picky, forty minutes if you want a, uh, a little bit of the best that Ontario has to offer. You're five minutes from the waterfront. You can water ski. You can paddleboard. You can. You are on the way to cottage country, but still, uh, you know, fifty minutes without traffic to Vaughan. Um, and you can hop on the go train if you choose to stay here and go watch a Jays game and then hop back on the go train uh, without kind of being part of the city. Uh, we have Arda, Arda Bluffs, we have Sunnydale Park, we have Minette's Point, which is kind of like a, a lookout beach on the water, but it's not a lookout because it's on the water, but it's kind of the, the place maybe at dusk that you go to uh, with your kids, your significant other. Uh, and we have festivals going on every week, uh, whether it be Kempen Fest or it be uh, some some other festivals that are happening. Uh, so far, so we shut down our main strip in the downtown open air Dunlop and, and pedestrianize it for on the weekends, which is provides that kind of COVID experience that most people grew accustomed to around the province, um, as well as some specific hidden gems that I'll tell you when you visit. I just I thought to myself, I'm not going to plug a specific restaurant over another, but uh, maybe you can tell your viewers actually you paid a visit. I certainly will next year when I come through for the AMO conference in Ottawa, I'll stop in and maybe we can grab a coffee. But I want to end on this question. And it's the most important question I think I've asked in this part of the entire interview. And that is, in your opinion, what makes the city of Barrie such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? It's that sense of identity, and you know, I recently answered that question, so it's going to seem like a bit of a repeat. But I'll try to, I'll try to expand. It's that sense of identity and sense of place that you don't get in other places. You're not even if you buy a, a cookie cutter suburban home in Ward Nine, you're not just buying something that you could get elsewhere in the GTA. You're definitely buying um, an open book, and you can fill the pages of what your life is going to be for the next five years while you're here, ten years, or if you're going to raise your whole family here for twenty years, you can write the pages and the narrative in that book. And that means uh, growing up in schools where people truly do know each other, growing up in places, in a place where it's where you're not gonna get a dirty look because you just said hi, or I'm sorry to somebody at Walmart. Whereas in, I did that in the GTA one time, and not that they were mad, but they're like, why are you saying sorry? Or why are you saying, like, why are you making small talk? Here it's kind of normal. So again, for people watching who live in places that are 20, 30, 25,000 and under, you, it's very unique how you still get this in Barrie. And some people want the best of both worlds. Some people want that innocence and vibrancy of a small small town, but they want the amenities of a big city. And that's what Barrie has to offer. Sergio, counselor, I want to thank you so much for doing this, for sitting down, taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to me, talk about the city of Barrie, and talk about your career as a counselor. So thank you so much for doing this. Perfect. Thanks for having me, Chris. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your unwavering interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you have gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavors to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. We couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light onto the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can help deliver the kind of content you have come to expect from us. Now, we're thrilled that local leaders from coast to coast to coast in Canada are coming on the show to share their story with us, each with their own unique perspectives and experiences. So mark your calendars and keep those notifications on because there's a wealth of knowledge waiting for you just around the corner. 
Once again, thank you for being part of the Cross-Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.